Hey, are you sharing? Sharing feels good. Have you got something to share? I've been speaking to a lady who's amazing. Her name is Benita Matowska. And she works with people who share. She's an expert, a global expert in the sharing economy. She's written a book called Generation Share. And she's been talking about change makers who've been making a real difference by sharing resources, information, you name it. It's an interesting chat. And I thank her for sharing her time with me to tell me all about this. See what you think. Maybe it'll inspire you to share. This is my guest, Benita Matowska. You look like you're in some kind of soundproofed corner. Well, I make it look like it's a professional soundproof recording studio. There it's, you go. It's actually my wardrobe. <laughs> okay. Well, look, it, it's good. I mean, I, I have a little corner in my office, which is my little studio here, so I relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, let's get going then, if that's okay with you. I think so. Let's get cracking. Okay. So you're a global expert in the sharing economy. What is that? Well, I define the sharing economy as a system to live by. It's where we care for people and planet and we share available resources in any way that we can. And what does that in practice mean then? Well, it basically means that we, we look to, we have over 3.5 trillion pounds worth of surplus resources in the world. And that's everything from empty homes to food that needlessly goes to landfill. And essentially, when you start to consider that we have enough food to end food poverty, we have enough housing to end homelessness. And when you start to look at actually what does that mean, it means that if we were to share those resources, provide access to those surplus resources, then we can solve all kinds of problems, world problems, and actually also have a positive contribution to our current climate crisis. So actually a sharing economy is very much about how we make much more efficient use of the resources that we have and how we understand that planetary resources are finite, but we have, as human beings, have got an infinite capacity and ability to be able to access and share those resources. So how do we do that? Well, on a very practical level, I mean, I always say to people, you know, when you get up on a morning, ask yourself a very simple question. What can you share today? And that could be something as simple as helping a neighbor. We've obviously been through and we're going through this COVID crisis. And you know we've seen all kinds of sharing and community activity that's happening from people who have been making collections for vulnerable and elderly people right the way through. We've seen around the world what I call a sort of pandemic of kindness, all kinds of sharing. And I think that's the thing about this is that you know everybody can do something. You know, that something could be as simple as smiling at somebody, as smiling at a neighbour. And actually that can just help them to feel more comfortable, um, connected in a, a time that is incredibly stressful, could be very, very isolating. And, and actually just demonstrating that, you know, we're all human beings. Look, we all have something to share. We all have gifts and talents and we all have stuff. You know, it's estimated that in our cupboards alone, We've each got about £3,000 worth of stuff that just never sees the light of day. And I don't know about you, but most of us, just looking at clothing, for example, we tend to sort of pick the same three or four things in our, in our wardrobes and wear them every single day. And, you know, if we start to think about how can we share stuff, not just stuff that we don't need, but how can we share skills? How can we share information? How can we build a more sustainable society and an economy, one that is built around sharing? And, you know, I've spent a decade working in this space known as the sharing economy. And, and my work is really all about showcasing some of the positive stories from around the world. And indeed, I spent four years doing carrying out research for a book that was published uh, recently called Generation Share. And I've collected over 200 stories of all kinds of change makers who are sharing in their communities in lots of different ways. So from a doctor in Greece who set up a network of free clinics for refugees and people who can't afford access to healthcare, 
in abandoned spaces using medicines that would otherwise go to landfill. And she's created this whole network where people can come and not only get the medical attention they need, but also they can be part of um, you know, a soup kitchen, they can be fed, they can connect with other people in their community. Some people are finding employment. So there's all kinds of things that we can do if we're, if we're sharing resources. Um, you know, we've also got some really incredible entrepreneurs who've set up all sorts of platforms where you can share goods online. And indeed, you know, lots of us are doing these kinds of things. And particularly as we here in the UK head into a second lockdown, you know, people are being connected digitally just as we are now and, and finding ways to be able to access and share resources because technically so much is possible and across boundaries. And there's all kinds of ways in which we're able to verify that people are who they say they are. There's all kinds of trust mechanisms in place. But I think what we're seeing through this pandemic really is a pandemic of sharing and kindness. And it's very much for me about how can we tell those positive stories of hope? And I believe it's changed the world. We need to change the narrative. We need to tell better stories and more positive stories. And you really believe we're finding that, that we've got maybe almost like a wartime spirit in this pandemic, that there's more community? Well, I think there was a lot of talk, particularly back in sort of March, April, May of this, of this uh, you know, wartime spirit. And of course, we had the clap for carers that went on over a number of months. We had, uh, you know, 750,000 volunteers um, came forward for the NHS in a 48 hour period. It's pretty staggering. And, and we certainly saw a lot of community activity. I think what's happened now is that we've seen people have found different ways to put that to, to good use. Um, we've seen the development of different organizations, the strengthening of community groups. I think there was a kind of initial sort of surge of people saying, I want to do something. I want to help in some kind of way. And in many ways, that was just an excuse to, to connect. You know, many people, I'm just looking, thinking about my own street here in Brighton, and I've been running a, you know, a community group um, for, for years and years. I usually organize an annual street party for an initiative that I run called Global Sharing Week each year. And, you know, what I found was that so many more people on this street came forward and said, you know, I want to connect with other people who need help. Can I do shopping? People were cooking for a disabled couple that live across the street who were unable to access the supplies and the resources they needed. And so I think, you know, people have found ways to be able to do that. And in many cases, people are driven by the fact that, you know, they themselves feel lonely they want to connect with other people so in many ways this has provided that that much needed excuse um, but I think what we have seen is also you know as time has gone on you know there's obviously there's a lot of fear and uncertainty about what's happening next people are trying to find ways to manage and to cope with you know with living with this with this virus and you know that the sort of shifts that are happening in society are really apparent um, but I believe this community spirit is only getting stronger. It may have become quieter after that initial surge, but I've, what I've seen is it's becoming more um, widespread. People are finding different ways. People are getting more organized. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of community groups that have really sort of established themselves now and have established, established different mechanisms and ways for reaching out to people who are very vulnerable in communities. So I think it's really incredible. What we aren't seeing enough of, though, Graham, are the telling of these positive stories. You know, news by definition, and I'm a former journalist, um, is something negative. Well, yeah, you know, if, it, if it bleeds, if it, it leads, is the classic. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and we know that we, we, you know, by telling and showcasing positive stories, what that does is it's contagious. Kindness is contagious. And it leads people to realize and recognize that something's possible. So I know from you know the response to my book, Generation Share, that by showcasing that a girl in the slums in Mumbai was able to build a school for other girls to help get them out of poverty, and she did this herself by educating herself. First of all, she was earning nine, the equivalent of nine pence a day, making necklaces and selling those. And ultimately, she was able to, to through social media, she was able to attract supporters, and she has a whole school, a schoolhouse within the slums in Mumbai, in Malund. 
and she's you know educating hundreds of girls and through the pandemic that wasn't going to stop her either she set up a digital school and she found ways to be able to educate those girls safely in their own homes and also distribute sanitary supplies and and food and and rice and grain and so on and so my point is that you know wherever we are in society whatever kinds of means or, or no means that we have access to there are all kinds of ways that we can that we can make things happen and i think by telling these stories of positivity and hope we inspire other people to enable them to share in their communities and find ways to do, you know deliver their own change making i believe many of us are change makers at heart but what we need to do is we need to inspire people and let them know it's possible that it's doable and then there's really no end to what we can achieve because yes our planetary resources may be finite but our potential to make change to share is unlimited what i like about what you're doing is and you touched on it there with the news you know people have a tendency to be very negative based on the negative information they're bombarded with on a daily basis and they don't realize and you may realize this as a journalist but I worked in I worked for BBC for a while and and I worked out pretty quickly that the news if it makes news it's because it's unusual if something happens every day if somebody goes to work every day and comes home safe and sound that doesn't make the news because well, to be honest it's boring but if somebody if something happens on the way to work or the way home from work it's an unusual thing it makes the news so once you realize that the news is basically a collection of things that don't normally happen but then you can then you can watch it with a bit of a filter because it's a collection of things that don't normally happen you know horrible things happening all over the world but they don't normally happen that's why they're news and but because we're bombarded with it we think well this must be what's happening all the time this must be normal when it really it isn't and I basically believe that most people are basically good I believe that you know there's a parade of shops just around the corner from me I believe I could put stop my car outside that parade of shops with the door open with the keys in the ignition and the car running and go into the shop and buy something and come out and the car would still be there because most people will just walk past it but we end up because we're we're bombarded with this negative information living in fear and suspicion if we're not careful and we just need people to highlight the good things that are going on because most people are basically good and a lot of people are doing some very good things so thank you very much for doing that is that the idea behind global sharing week well it is it is, and, I, and I, I, I absolutely agree with your perspective there, Graham. Um, but I also think that, it, for me, it's not so much about the definition of, of news being the unusual. I suppose I see it as the definition of news being something currently that is negative, that is fear-based. And I think what we need to do, and as storytellers, um, you know, people that are involved in you know, the world of podcasting and the media, we have this responsibility, I believe, to tell better stories because there are all kinds of stories that are unusual, as you put it, and fascinating, but they're not negative mm. and they can have a positive impact on society. And, you know, I have found through the telling of these stories through my book, Generation Share, that people are absolutely fascinated by the fact that some of these, you know, these people have, have created extraordinary change in their communities and you know, are saving millions of lives. You know, there are people that are working, for example, I met these two extraordinary women from the UK, and they run um, a breast milk bank. They're sharing breast milk to save the lives of sick and premature babies. And when you think of sharing, you don't think of sharing breast milk. <laughs> but actually, you know, what they've done is they've, they've provided access to a resource in a very um, you know, clinical, uh, safe, secure way that is saving lives of a very, very vulnerable, I'd say sick and premature babies. And it's estimated that, you know, 1.2 million lives are saved each year through the sharing of breast milk around the world in these milk banks. And, you know, we also know looking at some of the incredible organizations like Fair Share, and what they do is they divert food that would otherwise go to landfill to people living in food poverty. 
And, you know, they, they provide food for something like, you know, 50 million meals across the UK each year. I mean, it's just completely extraordinary. And this is perfectly good food that would otherwise go to waste. And so, yes, the idea of Global Sharing Week is really to showcase and to, to enable people to discover all these incredible sharing initiatives that happen around the world. This year, it was a very different kind of Global Sharing Week. Ordinarily, we have hundreds of events happening all across the world. And this year, because of COVID, our focus wasn't on events and on live physical events. But what we did is we created a global map of impact where people could find and access some of these incredible organizations like Fair Share that I mentioned, who are providing access to food, to housing, uh, skill sharing organizations, um, organizations that are helping young people find employment. I mean, all kinds of different organizations and ways that people can share. And we did that through this, this global map of impact. And, you know, Global Sharing Week has grown each year. It started out as National Sharing Day in the UK and this kind of crazy idea that I had of running a national campaign with really no funding and, and you know, pretty much sort of no support. And, you know, within a six week period, I had brought on board 45 different partner organizations and you know we we reached over a million people we were uh, trending on all twitter lists globally and people were con getting in touch from the ukraine and you know the netherlands and the philippines and all kinds all, all sorts of places and that's when i said well why don't we have global sharing day and then that ultimately became global sharing week so you know, we've seen that when you showcase this kind of sharing and this kindness and this resource sharing, and you really sort of think about people and planet and, you know, consider that by positively showcasing these stories, we can really have an incredible impact on the planet. And we can ta start to tackle some of these really pressing challenges like poverty and climate change. And, you know, look, we've seen that through this pandemic. You know, the um, if you look at, for example, uh, the levels of traffic that were reduced to that of 1955, you know, back in April and May, and, you know, flights reduced by 95%, and, you know, we were starting to see blue skies over Delhi and Shanghai, and, you know, the world was healing and repairing itself, and, and that just gives you an indication that, you know, by focusing much more on, on, on people, and by focusing much more on health, which is what we were doing, actually the planet was able to breathe you know, tragically at a time when humans were struggling to do so with this hideous virus. But my point is that it really gave us that opportunity to stop and to consider and to think about this kind of, you know, hyper consumptionist society that we live in and what's really important and what do we really need and understand the impact of our actions. Because when we stopped doing that and we stopped making unnecessary purchases and we stopped taking unnecessary journeys, you know, we were able to see some of the kind of repair of the planet in progress. And I think that gives us great hope that we have the ability to reverse the impacts of climate change. We just need the will to do it. Mm. And it's the same with poverty. It's the same with poverty. You know, if you consider that, you know, within a, a few day period, we were able to take all the rough street sleepers off the streets and they were placed in temporary accommodation. And if that wasn't a demonstration, that we have the ability to solve the problem of homelessness in the UK, certainly the problem of rough sleeping, and I don't know what is a demonstration of that. So the, you know, the, the resources are there, the ability's there, it's about having the political and social will. So in a way, there is a silver lining to lockdown. I believe there is a silver lining to lockdown, because also it gave people a chance to really, you know, when choice was taken away from you, you have to really consider what do I really need? What's really important to me? And one of the things that we've seen, for example, is the, um, the number of times that people communicate with their elderly relatives and their families, um, you know, has increased. The quality of communication, the amount of time people spend communicating with their families at times when we've not been able to, you know, I've not been able to see my elderly parents who've been incredibly vulnerable. And, you know, my dad's going through cancer treatment at this really sort of challenging, difficult time. And, and that has been really hard. But, you know, what we've had is we've had technology. I've been able to have, you know, every day I've been able to have video calls, WhatsApp calls with him. You know, we've had Zoom sessions. 
you know, for his birthday, I even organised a surprise audience for him so he could play his ukulele, and you know, he could still he could still perform um, with people from all over the world that couldn't have physically been, you know, at any kind of birthday party, but they were there on Zoom, and so I think we've discovered all kinds of creative ways to, you know, to enhance life, to celebrate life. Uh, whilst actually being a lot more resource efficient, I think many of us will really consider um, before we we you know hop on a plane to travel to the other side of the world to attend a conference for two days. Um, you know, certainly in my line of work, um, which is public speaking, you know, I think speakers and conference organisers have had to really sort of consider you know the impact of some of these events on the planet and find different ways of delivering what we deliver well it never I, made I, it never okay. made sense to me that we had every year we had climate change summits and world leaders went there by plane and i always said why is this not happening online it's a climate change thing for goodness sake I, it, that never made sense to me but yeah, well, and I, I, look, I think that, you know, technology, there's been huge advance in technology and also accessibility. You know, if you think about just Zoom, for example, you know, how many people have learned how to use that technology that had no knowledge before? Mm. How many elderly people have found themselves in, in a position of actually becoming really tech savvy during this period? Because there has been no choice. We've had to find ways of, you know, of adapting. And I think that's, you know, that's incredibly important. I mean, I spent about an hour and a half with my dad's best mate, you know, an hour the, the night before this surprise audience that I was providing for his 81st birthday. And, you know, he said, my kids have given up on me. I'll never be able to do this. And I said, I am not getting off this call until you are successfully able to use Zoom. And we did it. And it was worked perfectly. My point is everybody can do this. And, you know, it's... It's it's a it's a blessing that we have you know this technology that that can connect us at a time when we're unable to physically do so, but also we've you know we've we've learned a huge amount through this pandemic, and I think what's important now is that we put that learning to good use and this whole idea that's been emerging about building back better about reimagining society because if you think about it what the crises have done both the climate crisis and the pandemic have they've exposed the fault lines in society, the stuff that was not working to begin with. And we now have this opportunity to repair that, to build it back in a way that is sustainable, that does consider people, that does consider the planet, that is much more mindful, that is much more positive and healthier. So, you know, I'm, I'm very positive about where this can all lead. We just need to make sure that it happens. Mm. And that we tell these positive stories so people appreciate what they can do. It's also very empowering, this idea that, you know, you have somebody who, you know, a woman in London who, you know, single-handedly set up, um, uh, you know, an initiative that was supplying NHS workers uh, with meals. And, you know, all kinds of things that people have done, individuals, that, you know, during this pandemic, they've just decided to just do it because, it, it, you know, it was necessary and it was needed. But that's also very empowering because it tells you that it's possible. If you have an idea for something that can be of you know, benefit to society and planet, go do it because it will, it will be appreciated and you will get support for that. And I think that you know, this has been a really interesting time for businesses because the businesses that are what I call change maker companies, businesses that actually consider people and planet are those that are surviving this crisis because they're, they're providing something that is of value. You know, if you're only considering commercial value, you're only considering profit, you're simply not going to survive anymore. You know, we're now in a world where people want to know where their clothes come from. They want to know, you know, how their food is made. They want to know that people in the process are being fairly paid. That, you know, this is a situation that really considers humanity and society at large, because when it doesn't, we pay the price. There's a reason that we're in a pandemic. You mm. know, there's a reason that we're here, that where we are, we've exposed all of the stuff that doesn't work. Do, do you think that's do, 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 do you think that, that. That, that's true though? I mean, if if somebody is in the supermarket and they see shoes that are only you know ten pounds, or or a, a shirt or something that's only two pounds, I mean, they're like jumble sale prices. 
Do you think they they stop for a minute and go, wait a minute, how has this been manufactured for such a low price? Do you think people actually get there, or is there still work to be done on the education then? There's definitely still work to be done on education, but what we sort of know from the numbers is that the increase in, in you know what I call this conscious consumption, you know, is absolutely evident. That you know we're seeing the rise in you know some of these social enterprises, these different businesses. We're seeing you know you only have to look at sort of packaging and labelling, and and the rise, for example, of things like you know veganism, which has you know had a you know huge exponential. Well, I'm rise vegan now. Yeah. Absolutely, it's but it's extraordinary, isn't it? It's yeah, it's great. Extraordinary. Yeah. And you know you have to only have to look at the kind of take up of, of initiatives like veganuary. And this is all part of a wider consciousness. People are starting to think about, you know, what am I putting into my body? You know, we're in a health pandemic. So people are having to really think about their health and really consider those those factors. And yes, people are looking at labels. Yes, people are starting to buy, you know, you know, both with their heart and with their head because they're starting to understand that that has an impact. And also, I believe that the stories are being better told about you know how there's always a cost so you know if you buy fast fashion for example there's always a cost we saw an example um, up in Leicester where the company Boohoo for example were in within a two-week period produced and manufactured a new line of loungewear so people could lounge and stay at home at the start of the pandemic and what happened was cases spiked in Leicester because those workers in the Boohoo factories, which were essentially sweatshops, were being paid less than two pounds an hour and were in completely unsanitary conditions. And therefore, that's the reason for that that you know, lockdown in Leicester was traced back to these you know, fast fashion businesses that actually pay no regard to people and planet. And you know, these stories are starting to be told and exposed. And it was very interesting looking at how the fashion world responded to that incident and you know it was big brands were very very quick to, to to look at you know what they were doing and make it very clear that they were not willing to support those kinds of practices so I you know I believe we're in an in an environment a climate now where you can't get away with it anymore these things are being exposed you've got um, a generation of young people who really care about the planet because they understand that without caring about the planet they have no future Hmm. You know, yes, as Greta Thunberg says, you know, the house is on fire. We've got to do something about it. We'll have nowhere to live if we don't. And there's a generation of young people that really understand that. So I believe, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, fast fashion on the wane. You know, even car ownership has been on the wane for a couple of years now. People are starting to find different ways, different modes of transport more sustainable, or they're accessing car clubs or, you know, accessing electric vehicles all kinds of ways in which people are, are becoming more sustainable and and also we're, we're, we're finding ways to make these products cheaper more affordable more accessible we've still got a way to go on that I believe and you know but there's definitely a shift that's happening behavior changes is here people are realizing we cannot go on as we were mm. and we've also had this opportunity to stop and take stock and think about well, what do I need? What's really important in life? You know, when you're in a situation like a pandemic, you're really having to consider what's important, what's vital. Perhaps you've got a very sick relative. Perhaps you've got, you know, people who've died from COVID. It really makes you think about, you know, what's really, what really matters. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I see this as a time of, yes, it's a time of pain. It's a time of challenge and time of difficulty, but it's also a, a time of opportunity to do something to build back better to do something for the future and a lot of the work that I do is working with organizations is working with businesses to to become these change makers to not only survive economically and survive this crisis but actually find ways in which they can build sustainable businesses and organizations charities social enterprises public bodies that are making a positive contribution to people and planet and are actually recognizing that systems change is not just essential, but it's inevitable. I love the way that you're trying to showcase people doing good things and reminding people that 
basically the world is full of good people and a handful of rat bags are the ones that make it into the news and they're, they're the ones that get written about. I, I feel though that the key, we live in a capitalist society and I feel like the key to change will come through it being good for business. And I think that's a very important way to go. I think people like Elon Musk, you know, bringing the electric car technology to to more people. I mean, it was originally they were very expensive. He's now making more affordable ones, still not not cheap cars yet. But that's influenced other manufacturers to try and, you know, to try and do that. And for people, you know, people don't want to put the work in. They just they want a good value product. And if an electric car is cheaper to run, that's got I think some people are more likely to go for an electric car because it's cheaper to run than because it's better for the environment. It'll be a factor, but it mightn't be the main focus of switching from a petrol car to an electric car. And I know that you speak, you're a serial public speaker. You've spoken on so many stages around the world. You've, you've done TED Talks. And I know you speak at uh, big company organized events. Do you get any pushback or any blowback from some of the old crusty people that, that haven't worked out yet that actually having a, a friendly, a more sustainable message is actually going to be good for business if we get it right and don't get left behind? Because this, as you said, with, you know, Veganuary and the vegan movement, you know, I've only been a vegan for about a year, but, you know, I probably couldn't have done it 10 years ago because I don't like vegetables. <laughs> but now there are so many alternatives and there's so absolutely. so many things you can absolutely. do so I'm I'm absolutely fine and I'm loving it. And it's not a challenge at all. It's 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 quite easy, but that's because certain businesses like Alpro and people like this have stepped up and they're now making, yeah. you know, um, choices of milks and cheeses and, and and all the rest of it. And that's if it wasn't for that commercial input, I I don't think it would have caught on as quickly and I think my point is I believe that for the change to happen quickly you have to get the the businesses involved and I'm just interested to know if you've had any any pushback from the from the commercial organizations you've spoken to about this maybe as part of your your live speaking engagements or, or maybe otherwise yes certainly and I've you know I've, I've worked across sectors you know from the financial services sector um, right the way through to retail and you know it's really interesting if I look at you know ten years ago when I was talking about the sharing economy and change making and some of these themes that we've been exploring today, very very different response, Graham, to to even five years ago. What I've seen within and that certainly lots of pushback, lots and lots of pushback, and uh, you know really? businesses that just that just absolutely couldn't see how this the, some of these ideas would catch on. But what we've seen within the last five years is a, is a big shift happening. And I think that money talks and what businesses are seeing is that some of the most successful businesses are those businesses that have a purpose and have a mission. So some of those that are the most profitable, that are the most commercially successful, are those that are being run on these, on these principles, on these principles of uh, you know, caring for people and planet. And so, you know, when businesses consider that and start to consider that, you know, now if you are setting up a business or you're, you're you know, you have, uh, you know, a long-standing incumbent, that you can no, no longer only focus on commercial gain because if you do, you simply will not survive financially. You, you simply won't survive. It is expected now that you are making some kind of contribution, that you're bringing some kind of value to society and to the planet. Every business worth their salt has some kind of policy about sustainability and climate change. Every business worth their salt has some kind of policy about how they care for the people that, that work for them and how they consider their, you know, their culture, their people culture. So, and it's, re it's really interesting when you start to look at some of the numbers, you know, Social Enterprise UK have, you know, have, have, have you know, done some incredible research on this and on the, the commercial impact and the economic contribution that these good businesses are making and also the shift that's been happening with big, big business and how they understand that it's so vital 
that they are are doing something and not in a tokenistic way you know we've moved away from these sort of days of of kind of csr where you just ticked a box to the days of of, of action because it's expected and you have an audience of customers who who will scrutinize they see through it they see through superficiality and tokenism and and they will not stand for that mm. young people particularly they want to know they want to be involved in the process they want transparency and and they can't be duped it's really really interesting and they've got you know, easy access they've got easy access to the truth as well you know they can't be BSed to like they used to be able exactly. to they can go online exactly. and find out how does this coconut milk come to me and if it is being harvested by by monkeys that are being you know tortured and that to to, to harvest the coconuts well then they don't buy that brand of coconut exactly. milk exactly yeah. exactly yeah and i think that's important that we we continue to tell those positive stories and actually to show the benefits you know i've done a lot of analysis about the reason for um, the uptake of veganism and there are several reasons for it but one of those is language and you know if you start to look at the shift in the kind of language that was used and we start to talk about plant-based and people start to understand the benefits to them okay well that's oh that's healthy you know that's that's um, something that I'm putting into my body that relates to um, you know how it's like, it's like the kind of five a day idea you know, once people started to realize the huge benefit to them and their own health, uh, regardless of, of, you know, their commitment to animal welfare and, and you know, the, and the planet broadly, but once people started to understand what was in it for them, and then, of course, you had, I mean, every, every movement needs what I call its gateway drug. You know, it needs the thing that's going to help lure people in through the door, essentially. And for, you know, for vegans, that's been oat milk. You know, mm. you only have to look at the uptake in oat milk. Yeah. And the fact is that, you know, your coffees are so much better with oat milk. Yeah. I mean, they taste better. Yeah. They are better. They're better all around for everybody, people and planet. And it's really interesting. And we've seen some of these what were once quite niche movements. Oh, vegans. Mainstream. I used to think vegans were freaks. I, do, I really right. did. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so it shows that it's that how possible this is but it also shows it you know that demonstrates that there is this this huge shift huge shift mm. you know and and as more and more of these um, social enterprises and extraordinary companies uh, you know start to produce goods that are you know by very nature of what they're producing they're delivering positive impact there's a fantastic brand company called who gives a crap and they produce <laughs> toilet paper right and it's set up by uh, a group of guys who, yes, they love their toilet humor, um, but ultimately, you know, the reason they set up this company was because they realized the numbers of people in the world who don't have access to clean toilets and clean water. And they thought that was horrific and they wanted to do something about it. And so every time you go to the loo and you use this, this loo roll, you're making a positive contribution to building toilets for people that don't have access to toilets. And it's just a very, and, and they do this with humor. You know, you've got like fun, you know, comments and interesting facts, you know, on the, on the toilet roll. And of course, there's no plastic packaging. It's all completely sustainably produced. But, you know, 50% of their profits are going to build toilets. And my point is that, you know, we're seeing more and more of these kinds of businesses that recognize that through business, and through, you know, products that we all use every day, you know, whether that's our tea and coffee, loo roll, whatever it might be, we can actually create some positive impact in the world. Whilst creating, I have to say, a, a, you know, a cracking commercial business mm. that has, certainly through this pandemic, has gone from strength to strength, you know. So there are lots of ways to do that, and, and it, it's becoming much more of the norm. That doesn't mean to say that there aren't naysayers, but they just simply won't be around to, you know, to, to tell the story. And certainly the businesses that I'm working with absolutely understand that. You know, um, there's a business that I'm working with at the moment. And the question, you know, isn't what, you know, well, I'm, I'm not going to change or what do I need to, what do I need to change? They know they need to change. They know they need to do something. They know that they have to do something that is making a positive contribution. The question may well be, well, what is that? And I, I work with, you know, organizations to figure that out. 
and to look at the core capability that they have and how they can make an impact and how they can create a really sustainable you know, business or charity or social enterprise or you know, community organization by really focusing on the value that they can bring to people and planet. So it's a, I think we're in really interesting times. Really, really I think we are. Time. It is it is a hell of a time to be alive for for many reasons, and uh, it does actually fill you with hope when you when you find out that people are doing great things like that, and and the way that information is is readily accessible, and you know the growth of and I have to say this because you know that's what we're here for. The growth of podcasting is helping that. It's helping share information that you don't necessarily get through mainstream media, through people who, who are looking at it. So let's talk about podcasts then because you are a prolific podcast <laughs> guest. Actually, yeah, I can't I, I can't believe you don't have a podcast because I think it'd be terrific. You probably haven't got time. But you've been you've been a a major podcast. Do you want to talk about some of the podcasts you've been on and and what they do and what they stand yeah. for? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I've thought on many occasions, oh, I should, you know, I should have my own podcast, but actually the reality is that, you know, I love being a guest on other people's podcasts. And what that does for me is it gives me the opportunity to reach so many different audiences. Why I'm really passionate about podcasting, Graham, is because it's absolutely this point about access. It's about you know being able to reach different audiences. It's an opportunity for people to be able to you know consume media in a different way, and and you know I think that's what podcasting has done is it's really opened up access for people to be able to you know find out to learn i mean you only have to look at this from an educational knowledge sharing perspective there are so many different things that we can learn and do and discover you know in any given day by the sort of myriad of podcasts that are out there uh, so, and yeah, if you're I, only I, slightly I, into something you can go much deeper by listening to a podcast on that topic, yeah. Exactly, because some of it, you know, is really niche. I mean, I've had lots of fun. So, you know, from, um, you know, talking to Tien and uh, Dweeb on the partly political broadcast, um, we had a lot of fun. And yes, we did talk about politics, but we, you know, we talked about sharing and lots of other things too. Um, right the way through to Fair Trade Radio, which is a, a podcast that's put out by the World Fair Trade Organization. And what they do is they represent... Um, some of the different um, fair trade association organizations and businesses around the world um, and they have a really phenomenal podcast and again you know so much information there people can discover all kinds of you know fair trade businesses um, you know people that are involved in all kinds of manufacturing and, and all sorts of products and services around the world um, humans on a mission that was good fun that was with um, Natalie Natalia Comis um, and again, what she does is she connects with, like I love to do, change makers and people who have a real passion for something and are, are literally on a mission, as I am. And uh, another woman, Katie uh, Taylor, who does practical magic. And that's very much about, you know, empowering people. It's, you know, that's more in the kind of spiritual world and that spiritual realm. Um, you know, recently I had the pleasure of talking to um, Roy Field Brown. I mean, what a character he is. And he, uh, he produces and hosts the Mid-Atlantic podcast, so they look at all kinds of politics uh, between the UK and the US, as you can imagine. He's a bit busy today, <laughs> um, and, you know, a bit very caught up, obviously, with, you know, the, the drama of the US election. And also, he produces um, a, a great podcast also called Intelligent Speech, um, and hopefully my speech was intelligent enough for him to include it in that podcast. I'm sure it was. Um, so, you know, it's it's been fascinating for me. And yes, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, I have thought often about, okay, I'm going to do the Changemakers podcast. Um, and, I, and I started looking into it and I thought, actually, I believe, you know, one of the kind of biggest contributions that I can make is to be a guest on many other people's podcasts because these are messages. My big mission is I believe that to change the world, we need to change the narrative. And so what I want to do is to reach as many people around the world as possible with these messages, um, for people to, you know, to read this book, Generation Share, which, you know, incidentally is made from 100% waste material. Every single copy that's purchased educates a girl in the slums in Mumbai, feeds and educates a girl in the slums, and plants a tree. So what's not to love? But more importantly, what that book does is it showcases 
these positive stories. It shows that change is possible, change making is possible, and that we have enough resources in this world to solve these very pressing problems such as homelessness, poverty, um, you know, food poverty in particular, food waste. We need to be sharing and accessing these resources in different ways. And, you know, we can all make a contribution. Everybody can share. And so for me, podcasting is a way, a very powerful way to be able to share these messages for more people to discover all kinds of opportunities that exist in the world. And I think at a time when some people are scared, they're, um, they're, they're stressed, um, you know, they're fearful for their lives, they're concerned about the future of the world. I think these positive messages are so needed. And you know, for me, podcasting is absolutely a brilliant, brilliant channel and mechanism to do that. And I just think, you know, it's phenomenal that we have this sort of proliferation of them. And, you know, I will continue to be a, a prolific guest on as many podcasts as I can be because I really see the impact of that and the messages, um, the response that I get, you know, people communicating with me that discover some of these, you know, amazing stories from around the world. And they've done that through the medium of podcast. But yeah, I'm a little bit passionate about podcasts, as you can tell, Graham. Just well, it's bit. great. It's great to have you a guest, have you as a guest on the Pod Twenty on uh, Podcast Radio, uh, Benita Matowska. Uh, thank you very much for coming on today. Did I get your name right? Did I do okay? You did. Okay. You did. Where do we find out more about you and how to get your book? So I'm very easy to find. I'm at Benita Matowska on Twitter, and I'm I have benitamatowska dot com. Um, you can pretty much find me anywhere. The book itself can be bought directly from Policy Press, who are an incredible non-profit publishers that publish books about social change. But it's pretty much available anywhere online. So Generation Share, and as I mentioned, each copy helps to feed and educate a girl in the slums and plant a tree. And shares lots of positivity and hope. Thanks for helping to change the world and for showcasing the other people that are doing it. Benita Matowska, thank you very much. Thanks for sharing.